next speaker is um, Fiona Anderson. Fiona is the Assistant Director of Engagement and Implementation with the NDIA. So the NDIA is the National Disability Insurance Agency. So this year the Queensland Government signed an MOU with the NDIA uh, in relation to the 2016 rollout of the NDIS in Queensland. And the NDIA now has two offices in Queensland, one in Townsville and one in Brisbane, and three staff, one of whom is Fiona. So welcome, Fiona. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes about and give you um, an overview of where the NDIS is at um, in the trial sites, seven trial sites across Australia, and what we can expect when it starts in Queensland from July 2016. Before I do that, I'd like to um, play a video of a bunch of people who are already in, with the NDIS in, in the trial sites. The NDIS calls people who are part of the scheme um, participants, not clients, not customers, participants, because they're participating in the NDIS. So in their own words, um, we'd like to run a video now, it lasts for about seven minutes, and then I'll come back and have a, a quick chat about um, how the NDIS is likely to proceed in Queensland. Hi, my name is Brad Connolly. I'm married to Pam. I'm 52 years of age and I've got a son, Albert, who's 16, my daughter, Kelsey, who's eight. I've got a spinal cord injury at C4, C5. Um, therefore, I can only just move my head and that happened 16 years ago. At the moment, I'm part of the NDIS trial and first time user. I'm getting a, a, a little bit more support uh, for me and my wife and my family. Hi, my name is Siobhan. I am your typical 14 year old girl. I have been self managing my NDIS plan for about six months. I am in year nine at school. I had an absolute passion for writing and playing botcha, which one day I want to be playing at the Paralympics. Hello Josh, how are you? My name is Philip Young and this is my son Josh. And uh, today we're sitting in Josh's house. Uh, it's called uh, The Junction Project. This project came about because there were three families who all had the same concerns. And that concern is that uh, what's going to happen to these special young men uh, when we die? I want to be able to know that Josh will have just this most fantastic life living independently. Uh, my name's Tanner, I'm on the better side of 40. Um, my disability is cerebral palsy, quadriplegia, bilateral lymphedema and low vision to name a few things. My daily routine now is I have a support worker come in the morning to get me up, dress me, shower me, toilet me, help me get breakfast, set me up for the day and then they come back and do what I call a twinkle and tea shift <laughs> and help get tea organised. Um, again, personal care and then I have a shift to put me to bed. She's making the tea cake. Hi, I'm Vanessa and I'm the mother of two beautiful daughters. Uh, one's nine years old, Jenna, and my youngest daughter, Taylor, has turned six years old. And Taylor, when she was a toddler, was diagnosed with a rare genetic abnormality called Clastra syndrome. Taylor is the most vivacious, bubbly little personality. She's an incredibly happy little girl and um, she just loves being with people. Taylor has a therapy package. She has speech, occupational therapy and physiotherapy. And it's based on what her needs are. Taylor's carers and ourselves are really trying hard to get Taylor to be a bit more independent with her self-cares. NDIS has helped me, my wife and my family in many ways. Uh, I think first of all, you know, it's enabled two support workers to come in the morning. That's freed up Pam because there's so many hoist transfers that need to be done as part of my care, and you need two people. 
Since Brad's had the NDIS and the extra support, he also has um, extra care through the day to go to meetings and go and study, which in the past was also my job. Wake up. Look, I'm looking at if you feel that you're being taken notice of and you're getting support and people are backing you, you feel like you want to have a, a bit more of a go given you get the support to do that. Today I had my crew from the nursing service come in to shower me and get me ready for school. I then catch the taxi to school where I have a full-time one-to-one aide who not only helps me in class but takes me to the bathroom and gives me lunch. After school I go to Botcha where I meet my ramp assistant and train with my club for an hour. Before the NDIS though, my mum had to be my ramp assistant. None of the service providers would send someone out to ramp assist because their rules didn't allow them to sit on a stool which you have to do to be a ramp assistant. Without the funding, Josh would not have the future that he's going to have now. He's learning how to manage his money. He's learning to cook. He's learning to do all of the household chores that um, anybody in their own home does. So you've got three really good friends that you live with. Michael. Yeah. Martha. And Fraser. Fraser. Yes. And so this is what the NDIS program is all about, allowing three young men or your son or your daughter to live independently as much as possible. I knew it would make a difference in my life when it came in, but I never understood how much. So with the advent of NDIA, I feel like I've regained my dignity because I'm getting the assistance. Um, that I require to live my life in a dignified manner. Prior to the NDIS, our family was in survival mode and had it not been in place, I don't like to think where our family would have been now. Good girl. I had, was diagnosed with leukaemia last year and, and had chemotherapy in, in December, so uh, hence in that period where I went through treatment and the recovery afterwards, uh, the respite was incredibly important. So to have those people in helping out was, was fantastic and let me recover fully and get back into the workplace and, and be a typical family again. I've been able to return back to work myself part time and also contribute to the community. So we now are looking at what's our typical, what's our normal. We've got to act and I think the NDIS is one way of acting and actually being practical and potentially providing support to people with a disability across Australia as it's rolled out. Under the NDIS we can choose exactly what sort of supports we need and not have someone picking the supports they are going to give us. My future with NDIS is that I continue to live in my own home independently and just enjoy my family as my family, not as my carers, you know. They get to be my siblings, not my carers, and that's really important. So I'll just um, kind of explain the acronyms a bit. They're pretty hideous, sorry. NDIA is National Disability Insurance Agency. Quite often you'll hear it referred to as the agency. It's not the CIA. Um, it's it's the, the Commonwealth entity that administers the NDIS, which is the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So it doesn't really matter what you call it, it's all the same thing. But I'll just confirm that um, the NDIS is underway. I know there's uh, lots of speculation in the media about delays and costs and all the rest of it, but um, that is just media speculation. It is... Um, underway in seven trial sites in every state and territory except Queensland, just as was planned. Um, it is coming in slightly under budget, which is useful because for the scheme to be sustainable into the future, because it is based on actuarial insurance principles, it does need to stay um, on budget. So it is going ahead. It will start in Queensland from July 2016. 
It's likely to take approximately three years to roll out across Queensland. At this stage, we don't know where it will start in Queensland. Um, in, in other states and territories, the trial sites have all chosen different age groups or, or cohorts to try and get a really good taste of um, what the challenges are, possible solutions, and hopefully iron out a lot of problems before the scheme gets to Queensland. Um, in the ACT, which is one of the most interesting trial sites, I think, because it's um, a trial site across the whole state, it includes everyone from zero to 65. But when it started, it started with at opposite ends of the spectrum, it started with um, people in their 60s, and very young children, zero to five. And um, I think a lot of the learnings that will emerge and are emerging already from the ACT trial site will be very relevant to um, Queensland. Um, I need to emphasise that to be um, eligible for the NDIS, when it starts in Queensland, you have to be aged under 65. And I know there's uh, other rumours going around about that. If you are over 65, um, you, any supports that you get should be maintained, but you will not be eligible for the NDIS unless the legislation changes. If you are 60, under 65 when the NDIS starts in Queensland and you then turn 66 after you have, you turn 66 after you have become a participant in the NDIS, you stay in the NDIS or you, if you want to, you can choose to um, move into the aged care system. Thank you. So just very briefly, there started off with four trial sites um, from July 2013, South Australia, Tasmania, West, uh, sorry, um, Victoria and New South Wales. And then this year in July, three more trial sites were added to it in the ACT, the Northern Territory, um, and in Western Australia. Queensland is noticeable by its absence there. We don't have a trial site, but we do have a lot of work underway in preparation for the NDIS to start from July 2016. So the, the status of the NDIS in Queensland is um, the Queensland Government has signed a Memorandum of Understanding, and that pretty well sets um, the agenda for the the preparatory work that has to be undertaken to ensure that the NDIS can roll out as smoothly as possible in Queensland. And that includes things like um, data transfer. Where does the NDIS find people who, um, in Queensland who are likely to be part of the NDIS in future? So essentially, if you're registered with Queensland Disability Services, whether or not you get support or funding, if you're simply registered with them, that's a pretty good start and enables the NDIS to find you. If you're not registered with Queensland Disability Services by the time the NDIS starts, it doesn't matter. We can still find you. Um, we, all providers will be um, asked to provide information about people who they think are likely to be eligible for the NDIS. In the case of children, quite often we can get that information from schools and other sources um, or you can simply refer yourself or a family member. When the NDIS starts in Queensland, um, there will be uh, a whole lot of locations and possibly sort of shop front style offices set up across the state. And you don't need a referral from anyone, although you, you can use one from a, a doctor or a specialist if you want, but you can just um, walk in and we'll guide you through the process. Um, when we, we think the numbers will roughly double in Queensland, so at the moment there's 45,000 to 49,000, not quite sure of the exact figure, of people who are currently receiving some form of support or services or funding, and that's estimated to double to about 97,000 by 2019, who will, 97,000 people who will be receiving individualised funded support through the NDIS. And I guess that's the key difference. Um, at the moment, most people across the country, including Queensland, um, receive what funding they can through block services, block funded services. The difference with the NDIS is that every participant in the NDIS has um, a series of planning conversations with 
someone from the NDIS called a planner, who will um, take you through a series of um, conversations about your life, basically, and the life of your family. Um, and together you work out what your goals are, what you'd like to be able to do, the barriers that stop you from achieving those goals, the kinds of supports that um, are available to help you with achieving those goals, and the gaps. And the gaps that are directly related to um, the, the effects of your disability are the supports that the NDIS will fund individually. So for example, it could be someone who um, has mobility needs and may need a walking frame. They may need support um, with personal care wherever they are at home, staying with friends or family wherever they happen to be. They might need support um, with employment or with simply undertaking activities that they want to do in the community. And the NDIS will fund all that as long as that person meets the um, access requirements. Thank you. So the access requirements, the two key ones are that um, a diagnosis of disability helps, but it's not the only way you can get access to the NDIS. So essentially, if you have a disability, that impacts upon the way you live your daily life, if it stops you from doing the things that you would normally do, and if that disability is permanent, then you're quite likely to be eligible for the NDIS. You have to be under 65 and there are residency requirements as well. But in general, most people who get um, disability funding now are also going to get NDIS support. It may not be exactly the same because the NDIS is um, very focused on outcomes, what you're trying to achieve in your life rather than the kinds of um, what the money necessarily and the kinds of supports or services you have right now. So it may not look exactly the same way but for most people it should be a significant improvement on what they have now. So to move from the current system to the NDIS, um, if you go to the NDIS website, if you have um, access to a computer, which is ndis.gov.au, um, you can click on, in the bottom right corner of the home screen, uh, a tool called My Access Checker. And that's um, five or six questions that ask you fairly simple um, ask for fairly simple information about your age, where you live, um, your disability, and gives you um, a, a pretty good indicator of whether you're likely to be eligible for the NDIS. At the moment, if you go through that process in Queensland, um, it kind of ends there because there's no uh, um, NDIS yet set up in Queensland. When it does start functioning in Queensland, once you go through that My Access Checker, um, you'll receive a registration number and following on from there, the NDIA will contact you um, and advise you when we can start the, the, the entire um, planning process, which ultimately leads to you having an individualised plan with um, your own budget of funding and support to activate the plan, get the supports you need to help you do the things that you want to do. As David said, um, the NDIS won't start yesterday or tomorrow, um, and it will be a, a staged, phased process across Queensland. And I'm sorry we don't yet know the details which have been negotiated between the Queensland and Commonwealth governments. But um, one of the reasons for that is to ensure that we do have enough supports and services in place when people need them, because that's one of the key learnings from the trial sites, that people receive their individualised plans and funding, but in some areas the supports and the service providers um, weren't as at an advanced stage as they should be, and so people had money unable to really spend it on different supports and services, which caused cause initial problems because people seemed to be just continuing on with the kinds of supports and service that they already had. Um, and that's not the way we want it to stay. We want, we want people to be able to exercise a lot more genuine choice and control and um, access a lot more flexible supports and services so that it really, really can be 
tailored in a way that meets individual needs. Thank you. Um, and this is, uh, just describes, as well as I can, um, how the, each individual participant is at the heart of every part of the NDIS. And when I say participant, it includes families where that's relevant in the participant's life. So right from the start, um, following on from finding out whether you're likely to be eligible for the NDIS and starting um, the, the, um, what we consider to be a lifelong relationship, because once you're in the NDIS, you're in. Um, so if we can just imagine that that's, we've gone through the My Access Checker, we get a letter from the NDIA saying, yep, um, we'd like you to come and have a, a talk with us about the NDIS. In Queensland, we will hold pre-planning workshops, which will be meetings similar to this, where we take people through the entire process. We explain to them what the conversations with the NDIS planners will be about which we'll see in a, in a slide coming up. And the purpose of that is so that people can start to think about um, not the way the system currently is or, or what they have lived with for years or decades, but how they'd like their future to be. And for some people, that's a pretty big step to take because no one's ever actually asked them what they'd like to do in their lives before. For other people, um, it can't come quick enough. They've known what they want to do and they've just lacked um, flexible funding to enable them to do it. So those pre-planning workshops are really a, a first step in just getting people to think about what they can do with the NDIS when it happens. Next step is um, a meeting with an NDIS planner. And the, the planner is similar to the assessor role in Queensland but not quite the same because the planner doesn't... Um, the, the planner will ask you a series of, of questions about key domains in your life, um, and it really is guided conversations. The planner doesn't tell you what to do or what you should think, but tries to facilitate a conversation with you about what you'd like in your life and how the NDIs can play a role in that. You can have anyone you want at the planning conversations. In general, most of the, the planning conversations last about one and a half to two hours. Um, because that's really, it's, it can get quite intense and, you know, that we find that that's about the limit that, that people can, can tolerate and not have sore brains at the end of it. But you can have as many planning conversations as you need. Ideally, the fewer planning conversations you have, the faster you get your NDIS plan um, assembled and underway, which um, is why it's really valuable to have attend pre-planning workshops before your individualised planning meeting. Um, the planner uh, works out what's called a, a statement of supports which lists your desired outcomes or goals, um, the kinds of supports that you need to achieve those goals, um, where you're going to get those supports from, which is something that you would discuss with the planner. They might be from a disability service provider. They might be from a provider who has nothing to do with disability services, for example. Help with household tasks might be um, a cleaner, a uni student. Doesn't have to be a disability service provider. Um, your personal budget is worked out and you're allocated that budget um, for 12 months. There's a variety of ways that you can receive that money, which we'll go through in a minute, but um, the money has to be uh, used in a way that's outlined in the plan. So you have to use that money to pay for the supports that are listed in your plan. Most plans are reviewed once every 12 months or so, but if there's a change in circumstances, you can have a review anytime you want. Just call the NDI and explain why you need it. Children and people with fluctuating needs tend to have more regular reviews because their needs change much more. Um, and I should emphasise too that what is reviewed every 12 months is the plan, your plan, not your eligibility. Thank you. So those 10 points list the, the areas that the plan, NDIS planner will discuss with you um, to try and work out what kind of goals and outcomes and needs and supports uh, are important in your life. 
You only talk about the areas that are important to you. If you um, don't need to talk about mobility, we won't talk about mobility. So again, you can see why it's really useful to have um, a pretty good idea of the kinds of things you'd like in your life. So they tend to be the, the 10 key areas that most people talk about in their plans. And again. <laughs> um, and this is just to emphasise that the NDIS is about helping people achieve goals. And goals might sound a bit kind of um, grandiose for some people. It can be just about achieving hopes and dreams or aspirations. But it, all NDIS supports are targeted towards helping people achieve outcomes because that, in that way we can, participant and planner can measure at their reviews how far they've come towards achieving those goals. One of the, the most important things about the plan review once every 12 months is asking participants, well, you had, for example, three goals. What kind of progress have you made towards achieving those goals? Are the goals right? Are the supports right? You know, what do we need to change in your next plan? Um, and the NDIS does, um, it does really kind of urge people to think about where they get their supports. It's not all NDIS government funded supports. Many supports, as we all know, um, come from family and friends and community. And then there are other mainstream supports that everybody else gets that we're all entitled to as well, such as from the health and education systems. So the NDIS won't replace any of those supports. It is only specifically for disability-related supports that aren't supplied by any other system and which are not reasonable for family members to undertake. The NDIS distinguishes very much um, uh, what, what's kind of normal, I suppose, in, in everyday life. So the kind of support that parents would give to a child with a disability who's five years old, with the intensity that that often entails, is not what you should be doing when you're 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 92. So that's where one of the, the areas that the concept of reasonable and necessary comes in, where the NDIS doesn't try and replace informal support offered by families, but if that is unreasonable, if it is unreasonable to expect family members to provide a certain level of support, the NDIS will fund that, that support. Thank you. Um, and for most people, the NDIS seems to be all about people getting money and spending it on wheelchairs or services, but it really is. That, that is most definitely part of it because there's an, an enormous need for it. But the NDIS is also um, very much about supporting the social and economic participation of people with disability and their families in ordinary community life. Thank you. So this slide, you mightn't be able to see the writing, but it's, it's really interesting. Um, it, it's um, an analysis of the kinds of supports that people, participants in the NDIS in the first year in four trial sites are choosing to spend their money on. Um, and it's the first slide that you see there is based on the, um, the category of primary disability so in the media, you could be excused for thinking the NDIS is all about um, people with physical disability, but in fact, the greatest number of participants in the NDIS in the first year of the trial, 41%, were people with intellectual disability, developmental delay, Down syndrome and learning disability. The next biggest category was people on the autism spectrum. And from there, um, people with mental health conditions, physical and neurological disabilities, sensory disabilities. They're all certainly in it, but by far the biggest category is people with intellectual disability. And this slide shows how people are choosing to spend their money. And it, it seems to surprise many people, um, but the vast majority of, of people, um, when it's kind of carved up, are choosing to spend their supports on social participation. So it's 29% of people 
choosing to spend their individualised NDIS funding on helping them participate in community, engage socially, all that kind of stuff, which for most of us is not news. Um, one of the biggest um, unmet needs for people with disability and their families is the need to just be part of community, part of everyday life. That whole um, very painful issue of social isolation, no matter where you live, whether it's urban or rural or remote, is one of the, the major issues that people with disability and their families um, live with their whole lives. So it's personally no surprise to me that people are using their funding to help them participate more in the kinds of things that everybody else can participate in. Um, next largest category is independence, so people are choosing to spend their funding on a variety of ways to help them become more independent. So that doesn't necessarily mean going from living in a six bed group home to living independently in the community, although it has for some people. It can be a staged and very gradual move towards independence. And then the next largest category of expenditure is on um, personal care and, and self-care and therapy. So there are all those, there are other categories of expenditure, which are obvious there from employment and education supports, but in general, people are looking to become more independent, to look after themselves better, and to socialise more, which is not unique to people with a disability. Um, there are a variety of ways that you can manage the individualised funding that you get. And in Queensland, there is a lot of confusion about the terminology used. So the NDIS refers to self-management of funding, which means how the expenditure of your funds is managed. Self-direction is not the same as self-management. Self-management refers to funding. Self-direction refers to how you choose and use your supports, whether they're NDIS supports or any other supports in your daily life. So if we're talking only about funding, at this stage, 70% of participants um, have asked the NDIA to manage their funding, which means to pay the providers. When they use a service, the provider invoices the NDIS and the NDIS pays the provider. You don't see any of it going on. Um, about 26% of people are asking for a combination of the NDIS managing their funding and they personally managing their funding. And they can split it in a variety of ways. So for example, some people ask the NDIS to um, manage their funding for equipment, such as buying a new wheelchair, but they choose to personally manage their, their funding for payment of personal care or other um, community participation. So you can really do it whatever way you want. Um, fewer people, only about 2% at this stage, are fully managing their self-funding, which means they're taking entire responsibility for their funding. And um, not many people are using a plan manager at this stage, which is equivalent to a, a Queensland host provider, although there are, there are some differences. Um, we don't expect that to stay exactly the same. We think more and more people will choose to manage their own funding um, as it becomes easier, as insurance becomes a lot easier to deal with, for example, um, as people grow in confidence about managing their own money and as um, more flexible and innovative supports become available. If the NDIS manages your funding, there's no fee. If you choose a host provider, um, under the NDIS, they're called plan managers. If you choose a host provider to manage your money, there is a fee, but it doesn't come out of your individualised funding. It's um, a separate line item with um, associated pricing on top. And of course, if you manage your own funding, you probably don't charge yourself a fee. Um, for people who um, don't want to manage their funding or who can't, um, the NDI will always manage that, and that can be um, done in conjunction with um, trustee and guardian arrangements. Ensure anybody who would normally be in the person's life remains in that person's life during the life of their NDIS plan. Thank you. So what do we do to get ready? Um, 
We know it will start in July 2016, but we don't know where. The um, detailed phasing and transition arrangements for every state and territory in the NDIS except Western Australia has to be um, finalised by June next year. So we're hoping we have a pretty clear idea of where we're going in the first quarter of 2015. In the meantime, for the next 12 to 18 months, the most useful things that people can do is um, go to the NDIS website. You'll find many videos, testimonials, examples of what people are getting, what they wanted to get and did or didn't get. Um, the kind of changes that are happening in their lives. There are both positive and negative stories, which I think is, is not that surprising for such a big change in its early stages. Um, on Facebook, there are lots of public discussion groups that are not moderated by the NDIA, so you'll get a variety of opinions there. The Queensland Government is, um, or has organised nine participant readiness projects run by nine different organisations and they're at, at, travelling to various locations around the state. Um, talking about the NDIS and guiding people through the early stages of, of planning for it. But if you, if you do nothing else but go to the NDIS website and down search for um, planning booklet and download that, print it out, start working from that and thinking about the kinds of changes that you would like to make in your life. And if there are none, that's fine. Um, but if you want to make changes and, there, and you know what barriers you've encountered in the past, start kind of documenting that very loosely and roughly so that when you do turn up at your NDIS planning conversation, you've got a great um, jumping off point to talk with your planner about the kinds of changes you want to make. If you can gather together any documents that you have um, which provide evidence of permanent disability, that's very useful. If you don't have them, that doesn't matter. Um, if we're unsure about whether you'll be eligible, then we might ask you to, um, to, to get um, an assessment or to get more information from a medical professional. And in many cases, the NDIS will pay for that if you don't already have it. Um, but I, I urge people to, to, to talk, talk with um, family and friends and providers and supporters and advocates about what's possible. The amount of money that has been um, included in individual NDIS plans ranges from $500 to hundreds of thousands of dollars per person. Depends entirely upon the needs and reasonable and necessary supports that each person needs to achieve outcomes. So I'll leave it there and um, I'll be around afterwards after the Q&A panel if anyone wants to ask any questions. Thank you.